Venture capital funding is pouring into Asia with year-to-date run rate putting the region's tech startups on track to pull in, think about this, $56.4 billion. Leading the charge are China's tech, big tech giants who have taken the baton from more traditional venture capital firms. Uh, for instance, Tencent outranked Sequoia as the top investor. Um, here to discuss China's robust VC market are uh, Charlie Chao, and again, Anna Fang and Hans Tung. Hi. It's been so long since I've seen no, the two sorry of you. To see, sorry, you have to see us again. <laughs> I'm going to take this off and, and uh, hope that we can that we'll speak in English for now. It's, I know that's good for the two of you. I, I was uh, hoping to, to kick things off. And by the way, I want to remind you toward the end, please think about the questions that you'd like to ask uh, these three. Would you each take a brisk minute, one minute, to tell us about uh, about your firm, the type of investments that you make? Charlie, start with you. Yeah, I'm Charlie uh, from Sosco Capital. We founded uh, Sosco Capital four years ago. Uh, before that, I worked uh, at uh, Sequoia Capital China for five years. Uh, we started Sosco Capital mainly to aim the general information technology uh, innovation uh, opportunities, very huge opportunity in China. And uh, we try to spend more and more time to improve the post investment uh, supporting uh, to the portfolio companies, uh, which we think is uh, way back, way uh, behind the U.S. peers. Oh, good. So, we're we're gonna, I want to come back to that sure. subject. Anna, please. Um, Gen Fund was founded in 2011 with Gen Fund, Gen Fund with uh, Bob Su, China's one of China's leading angel investors in Sequoia Capital. And actually, at that time, Charlie was in charge of coming to Gen Fund, so we used to work together, you know, every week. Um, and now we have about 500 portfolio companies, um, 10 unicorns, basically in e-commerce, AI, education, a few different areas. And you're based in you're based Beijing. where? Beijing. And you're based where? Beijing. Great, and there's a Sequoia Capital China uh, theme running through here, and I'll remind everybody that first thing tomorrow morning, I'll have Neil Shen from Sequoia Capital oh. uh, China. Hans, please tell us about your fund. We have nothing to do with Sequoia. <laughs> <laughs> Never, ever? <laughs> we, we do collaborate on deals. Yeah. Um, we started in uh, 2000. Uh, we have offices both in, in US as well as in China, which covers both Beijing and Shanghai. Um, we manage close to $4 billion. We invest multi-stage, from seed all the way to pre-IPO. Um, we have over th about roughly about 300 portfolios, uh, of which um, 40 have become a billion or more in their outcome. Um, we're early investor in Alibaba uh, since 2003. We've and heard of that company. Yeah, it was a very small company. It was very expensive back then for a whopping $180 million. Uh, today, we're very lucky to see them go you know, past $500 billion. So having seen China grow up uh, from almost nothing to where it is today in our internet space, and now working with a lot of Chinese companies to expand beyond China. And tell everybody where you're based. I am based in uh, Menlo Park. I spend two thirds of my time on the West Coast, one sixth of my time, what, uh, two months a year in New York, and also it's two months a year in China. So I try to cover all three regions. Okay, very good. I wanna, I'm gonna now rotate and come back this direction, starting with you, Hans. And if, if there's one overarching theme I want the three of you to, to talk about is that if we were sitting here 10 years ago, we would have been talking about what U.S. venture capitalists think about China. We're not talking about that anymore. It's about Chinese venture capitalists in China. And Hans, I'd like you to address that and start by start with your views on, on the retail sector generally. Why and how it's different in China? Sure. We um, took a group of uh, our U.S. portfolio CEOs, some of which I was on the board of, from New York, from L.A., um, the Bay Area, and Denver, to our new retail conference in Beijing uh, a month ago. And uh, through all the whole week, not only did they go to a conference, we also took them to the new supermarkets, Hema, that uh, Alibaba has rolled out. And they have experienced a lot of online and offline transaction in person using getting a WeChat account, use the QR code, WeChat Pay, uh, linked to the American credit cards to scan and shop offline. And through all the whole week that they were here, they didn't use, have to use cash at all, which was something that they didn't find impossible um, before they go to China. So after that whole week, all of them went back and then changed their product roadmap. These are U.S. company 
with U.S. app targeting U.S. consumers, changing their app, uh, all of them are commerce related, um, but with the product or as a shopping app, they all changed their product roadmap because of what they saw in China. So I think that was 10 years ago, was unheard of. Even five years ago, it was impossible. But today, because China and the mobile payment markets is 11 X the size of, 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 uh, of US, you start seeing a lot more innovations here that you don't see in the US. Now, is, does that mean that uh, you're, you are somehow going to shift your investments to the United States? Are you going to be more interested in these companies that have an opportunity because of China retail? I think in general, we're looking for companies that can, uh, because of their knowledge through hopefully us and other value-add investors, about other markets to come up with services that are more cross-border or inspired by what they saw in other countries. Any company in their category, if they don't leverage the knowledge of their shareholders to get more global viewpoints, to come up with a more competitive product, will lose out. Look at all the unicorns that's out there. Most of them are consumer related. Most of them are cross-border. Like Airbnb that I spoke this morning is a global company. And any company that doesn't globalize quickly enough will lose out to their competitor. So Anna, I know you also are very interested in this theme of it's important to pay attention to what is happening in China. You've told me that the, the, this market is flooded with great ideas and opportunities. Frame it for the audience, if you would. What is exciting to you? One thing that I've noticed recently is just the um, Chinese brands. I mean, you're looking at a new generation of spenders in the post-90s industry with uh, higher consumer spending income. I mean, people don't buy houses. They don't buy uh, cars anymore higher disposable income, and you're really starting to see them actually purchase Chinese brands. So it's part of this consumer upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, so you know whether it's Lo Chuan yogurt or Zhaozuo um, furniture or Nei Wai, like the new Victoria's Secrets of China, um, there's this opportunity for startups to actually capture this industry. Like we have a company in Guangzhou called Perfect Diary. They're trying to be the Mac, the Maybelline of China, and there's. I mean, right now is the time. If you're going to build a new color cosmetics brand, it's probably right now. These people know how to sell on the internet for the new generation. So I think it's incredibly exciting. Um, I mean, besides what Hans mentioned, mobile payments, which I think is the other key driver here, but you have a whole new segment of users that people are building products for, which is really cool. Charlie, let me, let me ask you, what is your perspective on what is unique about venture capital in China? How is it, how is it a different game here? Comparing to U.S.? Yes, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the past 10, 10 years, the big environment for venture capital, uh, it's uh, changing a lot. The major change coming from several things. I think one is the, you can see the top 10 internet companies almost have the 90% of the market cap of the whole you know, information technology companies. So this brings a lot of you know change and uh, challenges of also opportunities to the uh, VCs, how to you know cooperate with the big big companies, how to uh, co investment with them or say a company with them. So this is the major changes in the past ten years uh, when they are when Alibaba or Tencent uh, at that time are still ten billion company. Now they are you know forty five billion company uh, forty four hundred fifty billion companies. So this is the one change. Another thing I think is the, the um, unique um, ideas uh, coming from originally from China more and more regularly. Uh, not like 10 years ago, it's quite simple for Chinese VC to copy from China, uh, copy from US, right? Uh, Groupon or uh, uh, e-commerce. Uh, so this also brings us opportunities and uh, also bring you know, a uh, unique um, challenge to think, think clear about the opportunity, how to tell the good innovation out of the better innovations. So uh, this is uh, you know, the, the two major changes uh, in, my, in my view in the past 10 years in China. Your firm is source code, and you have something called the code class. Would you explain that to everyone? Yeah, um, we basically we form, uh, you know, like 100 people together, 40 from our LP, which are industry leaders, the founders, the CEOs of the top com top information technology companies in China, like uh, co-founders, 
founders, uh, Meituan, Total, Alibaba, Tencent. Uh, and uh, we think it's very important for uh, young generation companies to have dialogue with the established ones to know how to cooperate with them, not to compete head to head with them. To get the funding from the existing established one is quite an uh, important uh, factor in the you know, competition, for example. So this we try to be the hub, try to be the organizer to you know, build the platform, and which we think it benefits, po it, it benefits for both sides. And also we think the way we try to be helpful also give us, uh, as a venture capitalist, to get deeper into the industry, to know deeper about the, you know, the, the, the updated, the most, uh, you know, updated, the most uh, uh, frontier uh, situations. So this also uh, practice for our internal uh, team to, to run, to run for an entrepreneur. No, and I know that you're also interested in the subject of talent and, and that you're, one of your firm's themes is investing in the team. Would you talk about that, please? You know, at the, we're at the very early stage. So our perfect situation is, for example, this year we've funded four people who left May Twine. Um, some really senior, you know, sort of uh, co almost co-founder top people who leave and you believe that you know that they know how to do this business, how to run an internet company, so you give them money. Um, sometimes it takes people a little bit of time to find to pivot and find you know their product market fit. So for example, Hans and I have a company, Little Red Book, Xiao Hongshu, which I'm sorry, uh, just say again the company. Xiao Hongshu, Little Red Book. So they started as um, a travel company. Right. They sent me a PDF travel guide, and I was like, "What is this? We're not, we can't be sending out PDFs like you know as a startup." Anyway, they pivoted to one of the largest mobile social commerce companies now. Um, but sometimes it takes them a little bit of time. Um, so that's fine with us. We, we allow them the time to figure out what they're doing, but it's about the people. So in, in terms of what we look for in the people, we look for an ability to, um, to learn, so you're constantly learning, your um, authenticity, so your passion and um, skill for what you're doing, your ability to influence, to really lead a company and build um, a large company, um, as well as your ability to tell a story and fundraise. Um, and you know, you mentioned team. Team's incredibly important because you can't do it by yourself. So we look for a complementary team, a team with chemistry and compromise. We call that the three C's. Now, now Hans, uh, I mentioned in my intro, and, and the, uh, most of you have alluded to the to Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, which right. are uh, heavy investors themselves. So let me let me pose a challenge to you. Uh, those companies are investing so aggressively and they have such vibrant platforms and they have so much capital right. that they're going to win, they're going to get all the wins and, and you're not. I think there's definitely a way for uh, VCs to coexist with the, uh, the strategic investors. Uh, like um, uh, Anna mentioned earlier, a lot of us are investing earlier and earlier. So the teams are bubbling up, we're investing in them. And when it comes to the right time, and Alibaba or Tencent ends up investing in that company and channel traffic to them to help them grow faster. And the speed of which that happened is much faster in China and it's in the US. Because when we invest in both markets, we see. You don't see Google and Facebook doing the same thing that Tencent and Alibaba are doing. And I will argue that because Tencent and Alibaba come into earlier and are willing to give traffic to help the companies grow faster, whether it's in the case of DD in ride sharing, or the case of Mobike in, uh, in uh, bike sharing, you see these companies pop and grow faster than their counterparts in the US. It took Uber, Uber started in 2007, 2008. They didn't become a $3 billion market cap, com uh, $3 billion valuation company until 2012. It took them five, six years to get there. <laughs> DD got there much faster in like, literally three years. You, you interview uh, Davis earlier. You know, mobile become a uh, over ten billion dollar company in literally two years. That just doesn't happen in the U.S. And the challenges that most people in the U.S. don't get, and they understand how come these valuations pop up so quickly, because Chinese entrepreneurs are working nine nine six nine a.m. to nine p.m. six days a week. <laughs> the market, so many young users that Anna alluded to earlier, are willing to try new services that Nate from Airbnb was also talk about. So everybody know the first three years decide who's going to be winner. You got these top three, I feel the only top two if they're number one. So the battle is on from team 
shareholder getting Tencent or Ali involved. Everybody knows what their role is, and every time a new calorie comes up, boom, you see that happen. Sitting all over the Silicon Valley or New York or elsewhere, people are just amazed and shocked at how much of a bubble it is. Definitely it's not a bubble. It's a science to how this works. It has worked several times already, and we'll see more of that happen, that playbook, in almost every new internet plus sector. Now, now Charlie, you're nodding your head at, uh, when Han says that it's, that, it, that it's a science. You know, it, it, I, I assume the same is true in China. In, in, in the U.S., it's becoming very popular for these photos of um, uh, mounds and mounds of junked mobikes and ofos and other <laughs> bikes, because I think because it's entertaining to be passed around. That doesn't feel scientific to me. That's a specific question, but to tell me what you think of what he's saying. Uh, actually, I, I think the, basically I have an idea that, uh, I have an observation that uh, the big uh, innovations in China uh, coming from basically two directions. One is from the existing uh, uh, giants, and now it's and startups. And I think the difficulty for the startups, uh, it's more and more difficult for, for me, I think. Um, it's uh, 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 the, 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 the big, the, big uh, the framework coming into the second f uh, phase, which is uh, we call the, the uh, you know, uh, establish, uh, almost establish uh, empire. So uh, we, we, we think uh, it's very uh, important for the startups to, to start from uh, for some place which is uh, far away from the BATs, TMDs. And uh, they need to, you know, spend, it's better for them to spend three or four years uh, to, for, uh, to grow from zero to one. Maybe it's not a good thing to uh, spend only half a year or one right. year to <laughs> be so popular. And uh, at that time, you will be face too much competitions. Uh, not only from the peers, but uh, from the big giants. Uh, for example, Toutiao actually, in the first four years, no one, no one cared. No one cared about them. So every, everyone who's Chinese in this room knows about them, but would you tell everyone who isn't, who doesn't know the story briefly, say the name of the company again and tell them, I didn't know, yeah. I, I guess I did know they were under the radar for four years because I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, Toutiao is... To, Toutiao. 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 T-O-U-T-I-A-N. It, it means uh, top of bus, uh, the highlights. Yeah, highlights. Yeah, it's a recommend, re recommendation engine uh, to give you the the best uh, you know uh, contents you may like uh, based on your behavior, based on the data he he, he has. So the the giants like Alibaba, Tencent, uh, Baidu didn't you know. Uh, uh, ignored them in the past, in the first uh, four years. And uh, uh, when we did the investment, uh, while I was in Sequoia, I interviewed like 10 people uh, from uh, Tencent, uh, Baidu News, uh, Phoenix News, uh, Sohu News, Sina News. Everyone no, said, nah. everyone said no. No. <laughs> Forget it. Not interesting. It's, uh, it's, uh, they were, you, I, we were uh, beaten in no more than one year. They don't have the content. They don't have the capital to to buy content. They don't have the capital to do the branding. Uh, but uh, they don't. They didn't know that that it's uh, another you know way to innovate. It's uh, another way to compete. So, yeah, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's the, the time window for the startups in China is very very key. If you have two or three years time window it will be much better. Yes. Uh, and that, that's your estimation by the, the time window. You, what you're essentially saying is your time window is measured by how long it will take the BAT to figure it out. Almost. <laughs> so it's important to check the another side of the table to check the idea about your idea. Everyone think. If the, everyone says bad, you actually have a chance. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good, very good feedback. Until they change, until they change their mind. Uh, 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 but Anna, well, help us figure out, there are, Hans states quite confidently that, that there's no bubble in Chinese venture capital. Are you as confident? 
Well, I don't know. I don't think there's a bubble because I think what you're saying is there are real users and they're right. good companies. But I think there is definitely this herd mentality that is a little bit dangerous. So Charlie's example is a good one where, you know, independent thinking, he saw something that was going to catch on and, you know, um, great investment. Um, but there is sort of a herd mentality in our, in our field where, for example, right now it's about Xinlin Shou, right? New retail. New retail. And it's what every investor is talking about. Now you have everybody going in to invest in this. And you know the key to winning this game, because it's maybe not a winner takes all game, is unless you put enough money in that every, I mean, it's, a, it's the Ofo Mobile story, right? Like, they have so much capital. They have 95% of the capital. No one else can really compete. So who is going to have the most capital first? So there is this capital game. So I call it the herd mentality. I mean, you see it not only with new retail now, but earlier this year was with Chong Dian Bao, the, uh, Chargers, the, the chargers, phone chargers, sharing right? everybody companies. is is rushing to that. And it might, I mean, I don't know that it's a good investment. You know, we didn't make an investment. But it, so when you talk about a bubble, I think when you when you have this herd mentality with, say, two or three themes per year, there could be a bubble in that particular sector. Which means that Chinese VC game is changing. Either you're super early, like what uh, Gem Fund is doing to some degree, Source is doing that too. So you're the first to in those companies. Or like us, we're thinking about growing up AUM bigger. So once BAT come in, we still have a capital to keep up at least for a couple rounds. Now, interesting, and by the way, this, what you just described is very familiar on Sand Hill Road in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley as well, this herd mentality of, of over-investment. Nothing, nothing it, that's cross-cultural, I, I guess, is the way, to, the way to think about it. I ha not one of you has brought up anything having to do with the government, not regulation or policy. Very good point. So why is that I a think good that point? the role of government is way overplayed in mm -hmm. the Western media. Mm -hmm. Most of the questions that we see in New York and we get asked in New York and Silicon Valley is that, you know, the, all the U.S. companies go to China, they have a tough time, local companies favored by the, the Chinese government, therefore it's hard to compete. That's that, that tune here over and over and over again. But when you're in China, you're hearing other companies are competing against each other. None of them have brought up government relationship as a way they beat each other up whether it's the case of Mobike and Ofo, or the case of DD and QuiD before. Every, all the competition happen because you have better product, you move faster, you change faster, consumers like you more, and you grow. It has almost nothing to do who has better government relations. And I think that's way underreported um, in the Western press, unfortunately. Well, go ahead, please. Yep. I mean, I, was, I think that this industry is really interesting because for me, basically, like I haven't seen a government official meeting for like years. I mean, I basically never have one. And for our companies, I mean, we did take them to meet some people in fintech. I think Charlie can talk about fintech regulation more, um, you know, given Chu Dan his company. But um, for it just these companies in the early stage, they don't need to really. I mean, they're so under the radar. But at a certain point, I would say starting in Series C, D, there are a lot of regulations that actually can make or break our company. So then it becomes important. But in our super early stage, it's not. Well, and, and one last point on that issue that, I, that for, for any of you, we, we, saw in, we saw an interesting dynamic in the, in the stock market in China when there was wild speculation, when there were wild fluctuations. Mm -hmm. um, there are multiple segments in venture capital where investors are going to lose a lot of money. I mean, bikes, bike, share, bike sharing is just one easy example. You saying we're going to lose money in bike sharing? <laughs> I'm saying somebody is. Okay. <laughs> Very safe. For sure. I hope not me. <laughs> Very safe prognosis. Is it fair to assume there will there'll be no? Will you, do, do, do people not expect government intervention the way there was in the, the way there was what was it about two years ago in the stock market? I think the stock market and VC are very different. I understand right. that, but investors will lose money. Right. And that should, that should happen. So you have better and better VC stick around. So I don't think government is bailing any of us out, and nor are we expecting government bail any of us out. Agreed? Yeah, he nods his head, but what does, won't, won't say anything. We have time for one question, if I could get one from the if I could one floor. Right here. The, the mic is coming its way. Please tell us who you are. Um. Paul Evely, I've been living in China now for uh, 15 years, and I want to hear everyone's advice uh, as a business entrepreneur. So I'm starting my second business. My first one, I grew to a $250 million um, market value. And I'm finding now, because I'm a foreigner, I have to raise the money outside of China. US, European investors, they like ideas, but every time you mention the word China, 
they start to lose interest, probably similar to what you were saying earlier about people in New York. And in China, either the Chinese investors don't have foreign currency or they feel much more comfortable dealing with a Chinese entrepreneur, even mm -hmm. though I speak the language fluently. So I'm wondering, for someone like me that's a bit of a hybrid, do you have any advice on, on where I can go? Well, I think the, the top VC firms, tend, they do, like all of us, are USD funds. But I think there have been some examples of foreigners being really successful in China. So Fritz um, with um, uh, Chunar and um, Saul, yeah, and App Annie. Saul with um, Daniel, right? So I think, I think, but I think one thing they had in common was they had a strong Chinese co-founder as well. Um, so I think um, to raise the money in China, my recommendation to get would be to have someone else, a Chinese co-founder, come with you. Right, someone of equal as you, which is not easy to do, but you have it, it will be a plus. And then the second thing is that if you're doing something that's more cross-border, not just focus on Chinese domestic market, but it has a cross-border angle where exporting something, importing something, it will help your cost tremendously. One more, if it's a quick one. Then I'll ask each of you the number one thing, Sorry, brief, oh, do we? Oh, good, much rather hear one from you, please. Yes, please just tell us who you are. Hi, Andy Mock with uh, CGTN. So you guys have done a great job talking about the entrepreneur side of the VC ecosystem. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the other side. What's it like working with LPs and how's that changed over time? Your institutional investors. Mm. Mm. Not, they're not jumping for joy <laughs> to talk about this one. Charlie? <laughs> He's the youngest <laughs> successful VC person in China. The He's known news, for that. The good news is, Thank Charlie, you. you have a little over a minute. Thank you. So, Charlie is in the LP ecosystem. Thank you for your help. Yeah, uh, I think the new, for new GPs, we need to develop our unique angle to persuade to have the money. Uh, and uh, I think the, for uh, LPs, uh, it's better maybe to spend more time with the, uh, uh, the, the, the local entrepreneurs as well, not just the GP, mm. uh, to know the, 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 the feedback from the entrepreneurs uh, directly and what's the difference uh, in their eyes uh, with the, the new GP uh, comparing to the existing ones. Yeah. Um, I want to thank the three of you for a very compelling and, and informative conversation. And I want to thank all of you for your attention and tell you that we'll take a short break and be back here at four. And please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You were great. You were great as usual.